It's the Hero Show. Welcome to the Hero Show, everybody. Starring the unappeasable John Hersey and the irrepressible Andrew Bernstein. <laughs> I am Andrew Bernstein, and you are indubitably John Hersey. How you doing this morning, John? I'm great. You know, I'm laughing because I never know what you're going to say before you say it. And every time you just take me by surprise. I love it. I'm great. How are you doing today, Andy? Uh, I'm, I'm ready to ride. You know, this is going to be a fun show, good show, uh, some real heroes as always. And I figured, you know, you are unappeasable, right? So, I mean, I think it's it fits. I don't think it's be so surprising. Unappeasable, you're not unassailable, a- the inevitable. <laughs> I'm, I'll take it all. Ineluctable. <laughs> Irrepressible. Uh, yeah, indescribable. Anyhow, uh, the, the current war continues, of course, the theme of this show, and it, it could be the current war uh, triumphant, right? Because we got the winners in, the, in this struggle, this struggle today. And Yeah, this is know, an interesting question. I mean, if, if you think about it, how was it that here's this great – amazing inventor. Last week, we called him the, the greatest inventor in history. I think maybe we want to reconsider this week. I'm not, not sure. But how is it that you know Edison, who pioneers electricity, and yet today we don't use anything that Edison created in terms of electricity distribution. We use the, the innovations of these two guys. It's just incredible. Yeah. Yeah, it is. When, and, and it shows that Edison... He was a genius, no doubt. I think he is the greatest inventor of history when you look at his his entire resume. Uh, but yeah. you know, we're we're all human beings, including geniuses, and geniuses make errors. We're fallible beings. Let's put it that way. You know, even the greatest, even the greatest uh, make errors. You know, when we discussed Isaac Newton, for instance, the greatest scientist of, of history. I mean, Newton had all kinds of other. You know, he was. You know, dabbling and al- more than dabbling, you know, he was he was you know working in alchemy and and he was he had very very devout, you know, mystical religious beliefs and you know so uh, even the even the greatest geniuses make errors and then cer- certainly yeah but if you, know, you go by beings, sheer, has- if you go, if you go by sheer number of patents alone then. Uh, then Edison definitely takes the the cake at least for that time period over a thousand. Westinghouse, when he died at the age of 67, he had 361 patents, and Nikola Tesla had somewhere in the 200s. So, you know, right. if we're going to take, we want to make this a, a a numerical comparison, a little bit more mathematical, Tesla would have liked, then, then I guess we can make that, that statement without qualification. But I agree. But also, uh, we look at the, the quality, the the specifics, the phonograph, which uh, nobody was working on, can, it kind of surprised everybody. I think, including Edison himself, uh, the first viable incandescent electric light bulb, which a lot of people worked on, but nobody had been able to to make it commercially viable. And then the first power plant, you know, the lighting system, and then the, the contributions to the motion picture industry, to the you know to the motion picture project. I think, you know, based on those credentials, I think Edison deserves the title greatest inventor of history. Well, you know, but Edison's lionized properly, uh, and we can we added to it uh, last week. But you know, uh, and Tesla, uh, Tesla went out of vogue. I mean, he was very famous in his lifetime, and then went into eclipse for I don't for several for several decades. And it's it's in the last twenty or thirty years that that people again are you know recognizing uh, Tesla's genius, and of course Elon Musk has uh, con- contributed to to that and you know and I'm, I'm glad of it but westinghouse has have fallen into you know a bit people are, are ignorant of westinghouse I don't, we, a lot of people say don't realize what a a brilliant inventor and entrepreneur george westinghouse was and so i'm glad we could give him you know some of the credit that he deserves absolutely it's amazing how little has been written and, and said about westinghouse but you know one of the reasons i think is that he you know he didn't have the charisma and the the he wasn't uh, trying to get the the fame like Edison was, and in fact, really tried to avoid it. And he, you know, left no published course, but he left no correspondence. Uh, hardly ever gave statements to the press or anything like that. So it's just very little for us to to look back to, except for his many incredible inventions, which were 
and, and the companies. This guy founded more than 50 companies in his lifetime. One of the most incredible entrepreneurs of the day, of, of one of the most incredible, as you call it, the inventive period, one of the most innovative periods in history. It's yes. A giant. Yes, it, is, it is not the Gilded Age, as historians mistakenly believe. As a philosopher in the Capitalist Manifesto, I take it upon myself to correct them. It's the inventive period, you know, and at Westinghouse is one of, one of the giants, unfortunately, uh, little known today. In fact, in, in the Capitalist Manifesto on Catman, I have this great passage, uh, which I think is, is true. I think the story is true. It's not apocryphal because I got it from different sources on how he tested what happened when he tested the air brake on. Uh, on on, mm-hmm. on on trains it's, it's, it's a story that you couldn't make this stuff up it, 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 i got i got it. well when we get to it I'll, i'm gonna i'm gonna read it although oops i see i left my copy of the capitalist manifesto in another room but that's okay you could carry on the show while i go pick up pick up the you know the, i got my copy right here maybe i can read it for us <laughs> okay all right yeah all right but yeah, I'll, um I'll, I'll pick it up when we get there okay uh i don't remember offhand what page uh, it was on. It's like a you know, five hundred page book. Yeah, but it, I think anyway, it's <laughs> there you go. There you go, John. So Westinghouse uh, dates eighteen forty six to nineteen fourteen. There he is, and he certainly wins the walrus mustache, you know, and the pork chop sideburns contest. You know, he looks. He looks <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely looks look. like a. Yeah, man's man from the late nineteenth century. Um, so he's born in he's born in, in New York, right? Um, and uh, so, yeah, we, it's it's a, there's a theme as we've discussed that runs through a lot of these 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 heroes and, and, and geniuses you know, about not doing well at school, or not liking school, or being bored at school. And uh, Westinghouse is one, is one example of that, isn't he? Our listeners must think at this point that we just have something against early childhood education, but no, I don't. You know, well, it's well, just no, kind not of when we out. not when we did a <laughs> not when we did the hero show on Maria Montessori, though. You're right. We That's did right. it. We did a hero, right. we did yeah. a hero show on her, and I think you made a good point. I think if early childhood education was more interesting, uh, like Maria Montessori, mm-hmm. you know, his program, I think he, these geniuses would find school, you know, a lot more compelling. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and Westinghouse did not. And uh, his father, you know, it's kind of ironic that he was like one of eight children, the only one named George, George Jr., actually. And he wasn't a stellar student and his father didn't have didn't have high hopes from at all and really uh, w- was very pessimistic about young George's future. Um, but right. he did allow him to work in the, uh, the ag supply and machine shop. And, you know, we've got to tell the story about this party that he wanted to go to and, and what he did in order to get to it. You know that well, one? Well, no, I don't. Go ahead. Uh, well, he wanted to go to a party. He's in his dad's machine shop. And his dad said, well, yeah, that's fine, but you've got to cut all this pipe before you can go. And it was about a day's work, if not more. So young Westinghouse takes it upon himself to invent a new machine in order to cut the pipe, cuts it in about four hours and then heads off to the party at which his father was not impressed at all. You know, this, even this, even this inventive young child who's, he's making his life easier. He just wasn't impressed. So, well, you see some people, like, some people, some people are unappeasable, you know? And yeah, <laughs> that's, that's, that's too I bad. Know. I mean, first of all, yeah, yeah that's right. First of all, Motive, non non monetary motivation, priceless. George wanted to go, you know, hang out with some chicks, you know, something at, at the party. But that's a very strong motivation for a young man. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but then he, which and very healthy. But but then he, you know, he shows how inventive he is in order to do this. His father should pat him on the back and say, "Son, you know, I I really underestimated you. You have an inventive turn of mind. Good good for you, you know." But he, but it sounds like he didn't. So. You know, not not everybody should be a parent. You know, there's some, some people just are just you know, you don't you don't recognize your own kid's innovativeness and industriousness. You know, his own enterprise, you know, his own son's enterprise, and and pat him on the back. I you know, I'd give him a big attaboy if if he was my kid. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Yep. So, so he's 13. I he's mean, bought at school, right? He leaves school at 13. He works in his father's shop. He said it was the best education he, ha- he, he had. That, that he, he enlisted in the Union Army for the Civil War, didn't he? 
Yeah, he snuck off at the age of 15 to join the Union Army. His parents begged him to come home. They had a, another son who was in the Army, I believe, was killed. And so he did. He, you know, he came back home, but then he, he convinced them to let him join up again. So he does. Joins back in the Army and uh, then passes a, a mechanical exam. And that enables him to switch over to the Navy as a, an assistant engineer in the Navy. He's responsible for maintaining the engines of uh, the Mascuta and the Stars and Stripes gunboats that were used to blockade the southern ports. So, um, you know, he's stepping forward with his engineering uh, aspirations and doing so in a very brave, patriotic manner. I love yeah. that. Yes. I, I mean, the, the Civil War, sad about it, his, his brother, so many... I mean, it's the bloodiest war in American history, right? Everybody on on both sides that killed was 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 killed was was an American, but uh, the South seceded in order to uh, maintain a slave society, and that was just you know that was just unacceptable, uh, and and of course it gave Lincoln the chance to uh, pet, you know push a Thirteenth Amendment through a Republican Congress. So, but but anyhow, yeah, it, it was. Uh, Something good did come out of all that bloodshed. So he survives, fortunately, and uh, goes to college for a while when he musters out of the army, right? <laughs> Not very long. <laughs> he le I mean, yeah. No. He left yeah, after like, like two months. Or, you know, yeah. 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 He says college was college was boring. So, you know, well, imagine if Westhouse House went to college today. He sat there through the leftist indoctrination you get in many yeah. classes. He might not have even have left. The future entrepreneur, uh, you know, and wealthy capitalist, uh, wealthy business owner may not have lasted two months today. Yeah. Back to his dad's Maybe shop. Two right? days. Back to <laughs> yeah, right. Back to his dad's shop, and he becomes like a patent-creating machine when, when, when he was there, didn't he? <laughs> He was yeah. Right after he he gets back, his age nineteen gets his first patent for a rotary steam engine, and uh, also creates a farm engine, something that can be transported around the farm and used for different odd jobs, cutting wood in a sawmill and things like that. So yeah, I mean, and, and then you know he he starts creating things for the the railroad industry, which is just incredible. Yeah, some of these yeah still in use. Right, right. He was so prolific in, in his late teens, you know, uh, the, the period we're talking about, that, that when he's, he was working in his dad's shop there, he was averaging one patent every six weeks. I, I, I mean, that's just, that's Edison-like, you know? I mean, that is really, that is really that a, is extraordinary. Incredible. Yeah, it really is. Uh, but we, 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 but he, his biggest claim to fame, of course, was what he he invented the air brake for for freight trains or you know, you know for trains generally when he was like when he was like 20, 20 years old. Uh, let me let me go get my copy of Cat Man. I'll be right back. You can you can hold down yeah, the floor sure. for a few seconds. Yeah. So when he was twenty one, he invented the the car replacer. So at the time, if a train went off the track, there was really no good way to get it back onto the track. So he invented this mechanism for getting the cars back onto the track at twenty one years old. He also invented something called the reversible frog, which made it easier to shift tracks. You get trains from one track to another. And then at some point he witnesses a head on collision between two trains and he realizes just how stupid and laughable the current system of train braking is. You've got uh, guys on top of the train cars. Each car has its own system of brakes and you've got to, you've got to turn this wheel and they've all got to do it in, in coordination to, to stop the train at the right time or else you get this you know, juttery, just jittery stop and, and people are getting hurt all the time. So uh, he sees John, an opportunity here. Uh, John, one of the most dangerous professions in, in the mid 19, late night, mid to late 19th century America was brake man on a train. Cause they had to jump off the moving train and, apl and apply the brakes, you know, on, on each car. I, I don't know how many brake men died on the average every year, but it was it was it was a lot. It was like carnage on the you know on the yeah carnage on the railroads. It was an extraordinarily dangerous profession. And Westinghouse conceived the idea of using air, you know, developing brakes using air. Now this is very counterintuitive. <laughs> You're going to stop one of these freight <laughs> trains which are barreling down. I don't know what their mass is. I mean, it's tremendous. Tremendous! You're going to stop it with air, and, and, and in fact, according to one story, 
you know, the big, the first great railroading man in American history was Cornelius Vanderbilt. Commodore, Commodore Vendor. We got to do a hero sh show episode on him one day. He's, a, he's the guy who, you know, who uh, built the, the New York Central. And his son, William Vanderbilt, is the one who built Grand Central Terminal in New York City. Anyway, uh, I, we, we discussed Vanderbilt, I think, briefly when we were in the Rockefeller episode, right? He was a profane guy. He was a, he was a tough guy. I mean, he was unappeasable. You know, he was, he was a, he was cuss, he cussed like his, you know, any of his, his yard hands. And he, yeah, he was a rough dude, as they'd say by my native Brooklyn. And, um, well, Westinghouse had evidently had a business meeting. Young Westinghouse w went to propose, you know, th that was the biggest problem in railroading back. How do you stop one of these things? <laughs> they, they got, you know, it took them miles, you know, to, to stop. Oh. Uh, so Westinghouse went, you know, a business meeting with Vanderbilt and proposed his idea for the air brake. And Vanderbilt just like, you know, practically, you know, had a cow. He said, he, he said to young man, you know, according to various versions of this story that I read, young man, you propose to stop one of my freight trains with wind? <laughs> young man, are you mad? You know, and, and then, so the meeting with, the business meeting with Vanderbilt didn't go so well. But, uh. <laughs> but it did, it did with some yeah. of the other some of the other railroaders in Pennsylvania. Didn't he just show up in Pittsburgh one day and he didn't know where to go? And he, he asked somebody, uh, how do I get here? And, and the guy happened to be a, a wealthy investor and the two got to talking and he, and he was one of the ones who helped him set up uh, this original company. So and and that could be the, that you know, could be, there's a, there's a lot of, this is, there's the problem, you know, when, when you're dealing, you know, with, with historic events, there's, uh, you know, it, it's hard to separate the, these, these amazing, these extraordinary stories. It's hard to filter out what's true from what's apocryphal. And that it, it, it could be, but what happened, yeah, this one might be apocryphal. Yeah, it, it's possible. Uh, but let's put it this way. It's, uh, if the story ain't true, it ought to be. Right, it's, it's, right. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great story. But the story about what happened when, when, he, when he first got the opportunity to test the air brake on a, on a train in the, in, in the Pittsburgh area, that comes from several different sources. So I think, I think, it's, I, I think it's accurate. And I you know, wrote about it in the Capitalist Manifesto. Let me read, let, let me read this, John, because this is just, this is just uh, amazing. So this is in, in Pittsburgh, uh, Steubenville Division of the Panhandle Railroad. Uh, uh, Westinghouse got opportunity to test, test this. And, and the, the railroad stipulated that Westinghouse had to assume all expenses and accept all the risk, which he did. So on the day of the test, Westinghouse, Bagley, and Card, the two you know, uh, entrepreneurs, all boarded the train. Incredibly, despite the railroad's measures to keep the track clear, as the train emerged from the Grant Hill Tunnel in Pittsburgh, a wagon two blocks ahead blocked the line. The horses reared in fright, throwing the driver to the track. Crazy George, that's what, that's what Westinghouse was called because of his idea of an air brake. Crazy George's brake was applied, and the train stopped a bare four feet from the terrified driver. I mean, it's like, it's like, it's like they choreographed it, you, you, you know, <laughs> the, the train's passengers, some of whom were bruised and angry from the jolting they'd received, raced outside to see what had happened. When they realized the truth, their anger turned to congratulations. The absurd and unsound invention had worked. Subsequently, Westinghouse, Bagley, and Card met with prominent railroad officials. The result was the formation of the Westinghouse Air Brake Company with Westinghouse as president. So this, this was, uh, and he was like 20 years old, you know, at, at, at this time. So crazy George turned out to be not so crazy after all. That's amazing. Uh, that story, I think, is true because it comes from several, several diff different sources. So that's the, you, you, can't, you, you can't make that stuff up, you know. Four feet from it stops four feet. Yeah, you know, it was two blocks ahead when it came out of the tunnel. Back then, it took you know several miles to to halt a, a train. So <laughs> I mean, you can't get a more definitive demonstration of an invention than that. 
And of course, the press was there to report on on this demonstration. And so word got out and immediately the, the, this was just a tremendous unintended like success beyond what what Westinghouse could have imagined. And, and so um, he starts, like you said, Wabco, uh, Westinghouse Air Brake Company. And that company is still around today. It's now called Wabtech, 148 years later, uh, and still doing what they were then based on designs from Westinghouse. And of course, these designs, these air brake designs are also used in big rigs and in, in tractor trailer trucks. So it's just, it's incredible. And apparently he read about this in a newspaper. He read a newspaper article. Somebody had created the pneumatic hammer so that they could use it for like mining operations, drilling into rock with compressed air. He thought, well, if you can, if you can break rock with this thing, why can't you stop a train with it? <laughs> so right. yeah, and he'd right. go on to create many more things for the railroad companies as well. Uh, yeah, Westinghouse of, of his many patents, I know uh, a large percentage of them were in the in the railroad industry, and uh, you know, moving on here. So he he and his wife Marguerite, right? Uh, they had a large bought a, now he's he's making money, and uh, they bought a large property in Pittsburgh, which they called Solitude. <laughs> and uh, every day he was digging, he was digging for natural gas, you know, in his in his front yard, and and uh, he had he had built like a derrick, built like a derrick, you know, in his in his front yard, and you you figure you know figure a lot of wives may not be too happy with 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 this, but Marguerite Westinghouse must have been quite a woman because you know she she said to him, well, it's nice to have you work at home, you know, yeah, <laughs> so she. But they ended up. So they ended she up, thought. Yeah, right. They, they, they had they had they had a major accident, didn't they? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. He, I mean, he he smells gas apparently in her garden and starts actually invites some people over to drill. They and they tap what they think is this small gas vein, except uh, at about three a.m. on May 29th in eighteen eighty four, a volcano like geyser starts spewing mud all over the place from their front yard and it, it it takes a full day for the mud to subside but then for an entire week this thing is just shooting out natural gas at a hurricane like speed it's just absolutely uh unsafe and extremely loud and of course smells terrible and all the neighbors are are really really peeved and it takes westinghouse one week to come up with a means of capping this thing and you know you've got to keep in mind at this point, natural gas was uh, a killer. I mean, it was prevalent, and, and it, nobody had really seen it. So it was this dangerous thing. It often caused explosions, and it smelled bad, and and people weren't really sure how to handle it. But Westinghouse, you know, oh well, I caused this problem. Now I've got to fix it. So he caps it, and over the next few months, um, by the by the beginning of summer, he starts Philadelphia Company, a company for distributing gas. Uh, he comes up with a means of piping the gas. Uh, at some point, somebody decides it's a good idea to just to test it, apparently, that this is really gas, and they let a match and send this 100-foot <laughs> plume of fire into the air, which, uh, again, really peeves the neighbors. But, uh, yeah. It's like, it's like why it's torch. Yeah, why it's torch and Atlas Shrugged. But right. within a year, he's got 28 new inventions in the field of of natural gas, and he's essentially created a, a new industry for, for, uh, for energy and made this, this industry safe. You know, he, he patents the reduction valve so that you can reduce the pressure of gas so that you've got like a, this sort of well geyser like thing that is completely uncontrollable. Well, how do you, how do you pressure that down to get it into somebody's home? So it's at a usable pressure. Uh, he comes up with the reduction valve. Uh, he comes up with a meter so that you can find out how much gas people are using and, and charge accordingly, and then uh, methods for for preventing and detecting leaks, and also uh, came up with an automatic shutoff valve so that uh, if the pressure drops below what's required to keep the flame going, it's not just sitting there spewing gas; it'll actually just shut the gas off. So quickly, uh, you know turned this very unsafe thing. It is kind of a theme here, you know, with trains. Uh, mm -hmm. And he had created a fail-safe system with the trains as well. So if the if the brakes 
uh, if the if the pressure failed at any point in, in the train's brake system, it would just stop the train. Same thing here. And uh, he takes something that's really dangerous that nobody knows what to do with, and he makes it, saves it, and puts it to use. So, um, and he goes, we, we he have goes a on lot. to do the same. Yeah, there's a theme here. You're right. Yeah. He goes on to do the same, you know, with, with uh, alternating current, which dealing with such heavy voltages was 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 dangerous. But we should yeah, we should say that his patents his patents uh uh in, in, in this field made natural gas available to many. So you're right. It's it's like he really contributed to the energy uh industry. And uh but Westinghouse really makes his name when he gets into the uh, the electrical gets goes into the electrical industry in the in the 1880s and this is what, uh, here we go back to the current war you know uh, <laughs> because he, you know he realized that that the direct current favored by Edison has very limited range it's it's uh, you know it's About a mile. it's it's it yeah it's viable w within large urban areas but even there as he pointed out, if, if Edison was going to electrify uh, all of New York City, even just Manhattan Island, he would need power stations all, you know, all, all up and down the, you know, the length of, of Manhattan Island. And certainly D.C. was not viable for rural America. It's, it's, uh, it's just, it just didn't have the capacity to transmit energy over the vast distances of the North American continent. But elect alternating current did. And, and I think the hardest thing to do is to see the future, you know, uh, especially especially when the towering figure of Thomas Edison, Thomas Edison stands in the way, you know, of that vision. But Westinghouse saw that alternating current was the future, and that's that is the way to go. And uh, he recognized um, he, he recognized he he needed a, he, he needed the, the 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 AC induction motor, and he, he was able to get that from Nikola Tesla, wasn't he? Yeah, so it's really, it's interesting because you can see, you can almost see how his mind worked here. I mean, he had figured out how to reduce the pressure of gas. And now what you have with AC is you have an incredibly high voltage that you need to get AC across long distances. But then how do you step that down for consumer right. use inside the home so you don't kill people? And he, he was just applying a similar concept. Um, so right. in 85, 1885, He'd heard of the um, the uh, he'd heard of a transformer. So there are a few English engineers, I believe, Gallard and Gibbs, had created a, a transformer to step electricity up and down. Edison had, or sorry, Westinghouse had read about this in a, uh, a, a electricity journal. So he buys the patent from them and he starts forming the Westinghouse Electric and Manufacturing Company. And uh, right. by 87, he's already competing head to head with Edison. And, you know, we talked about this last week. Edison had 121 stations by 1887 and Westinghouse had already like 68. But it's not until 1889 that uh, Tesla patents his, patents his, um, his, his polyphase system, his, his AC induction motor and, and, uh, makes this debut uh, pronouncement uh, at the front of the American Institute for Electrical Engineers. He, you know, he shows off his induction motor, and Westinghouse catches wind of that, and so recruits Tesla, buys all of his patents. Um, he's he's willing and ready to offer him up to a million dollars for his seven patents on uh, AC power generation and distribution. But uh, in the end, Tesla took about sixty five thousand with a salary of forty five thousand dollars a week. And um, this is quite the deal. Two and a half, two dollars and fifty cents per horsepower generated uh, from any of his designs. So uh, you know, this is this is a very fair fair deal, and uh, Tesla is is really happy with it. And uh, Westinghouse convinces him to move to Pittsburgh and, and help him with Westinghouse Electric. Right, right, and yeah, Tesla. That was a lot of money. Uh, well, well, first of all, you're you're right. It's, it's given based on zero not zero technical knowledge. Yeah, it's, it's, it, look, it seems to me just looking at the history here that the two big uh, technical problems here were the, you know you know the st stepping the power down, up and down, uh, and then the AC induction motor. Those are you know, he, so 
uh, Wesley Anderson acquires the patents for both the transformer and for for Tesla's uh, induction AC induction motor, and then he's in, and then he's in business. Now he's now he's up and running. And yeah, Tesla Tesla made a lot of money. I mean, uh, sixty thousand dollars he sold the you know the patent rights for the AC induction motor. That's sixty thousand dollars in eighteen eighty something. That was a lot of that's a lot of money. I mean, I forget how much that would be worth in today's money, but it's, it's hundreds, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars, and he's making roughly fifty thousand dollars a week. Uh, uh, that was in today's money, wasn't it? I mean, because he was he, he, what he was paid forty five a week. Yeah, forty five a week. I think in in eighties in eighteen eighties money, I believe. Yeah, R I mean, really? forty five a week today. Forty five thousand. Yeah, forty five dollars. Yeah, right. Dollars. Well, yeah, <laughs> forty five dollars, not right. thousand, not thousand. Right, right. But in mm -hmm. today's money, that's that's worth, you know, that's, that's worth thousands. Yeah. yeah, that's worth thousands of of dollars. So Tesla, there he is, Nick Nikola Tesla. So let's uh, let's we, we come back to Westinghouse, John. But let's let's discuss Tesla, you know, uh, a little Absolutely. bit. So his dates, Tesla's dates, eighteen fifty six to nineteen forty three. Uh, so he lived uh, in, into his eighties. Uh, interestingly, his father was, you know, he's from Serbia. And uh, the Serbs tend to be. Present day, uh, was it present day Croatia? He was, he had both Croatian and Serbian uh, blood. Well, let me tell you something. I think Serbs, even before I spent a year in the Balkans and Bulgaria, I had learned that the Serbs tend to be intensely nationalistic. And, uh, you know, I made the mistake of, uh, I was given a lecture. I don't even, this goes back years. I don't even remember where or what it was about. What I remember is I made the mistake of saying that, that, that Tesla emigrated to the United States from Croatia. And this guy comes up to me afterwards, huh. you know, the Serbian dude comes, I think it was in New York. The Serbian dude comes up to me afterwards and he says, he said, Dr. Bernstein, he says, Tesla might have emigrated from Croatia, but he's Serb, he's a Serb. I said, oh, okay, sorry. You know, well, he's, he's, he's Serb, he's a Serb. But his, his father was an Orthodox priest. And um, yeah. uh, he wanted wanted his son to uh, become a priest, also as as I recall. And here here we are looking at, at young Tesla's education. And here we have more of a of a mixed case because I mean he finished high school four years high school in three years. Uh, he you know he was a he was a he was a brilliant kid, outstanding student. Uh, almost died of cholera, at, you know after yeah. that. And he went to. He went to tech school at Graz, and he, he, he said that he worked from 3 a.m. to 11 p.m., seven days a week, no holidays, nothing. Just uh, he, And the professors told his father that to get him out of school, the kid's going to die of old. The kid's going to kill himself uh, from overwork. But um, in his second year, I, I don't remember the reason why, but he lost his scholarship, and he got addicted to gambling. Right, and yeah. uh, he lost. He lost money. Drinking thing. He had to drop out because he gambled away his tuition money. Yeah, and, right. Uh, not not a good time for him. But uh, so he, yeah, he, he dropped he out, out, out seven, and his mm -hmm. seven is seven ties with his family because he didn't want to tell him that he had, that he had dropped out of school. But uh, eventually, he turns up. Shortly after that, working for Continental Edison in Paris, and um, you know, yeah, he, he's a yeah. Go ahead. He he befriends Charles Batchelor well, well over That's there, right. and I think he was working for a for a uh, yeah a telegraph company over there, and and Charles Batchelor, uh, you know, Edison, uh, sorry, Tesla wants to come to the U.S. Charles Batchelor writes him a letter of recommendation. Uh, an introduction to Thomas Edison. So Charles Batchelor is sort of the right hand man of Thomas Edison. In fact, we talked about him last week. He he was the one who actually came up with a carbon dusted filament for the light bulb. And really, he created that that really commercially viable light bulb in the lab of Edison under Edison's direction. But Batchelor writes a, a letter to Edison saying, "I know two great men in the world: you and this man now standing in front of you, Nikola Tesla." So hell of an introduction. Wow. And, wow! Uh, yeah, that is that that is, and so Tesla emigrates to the United States, eighteen eighty four, uh, and works briefly or for several months for uh, for Edison. And by the way, there's 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 all these. I gotta say something. There's all these urban 
urban legends here. You know, uh, one, one of them is that Edison stole his ideas from Tesla. This is a common belief, by the way, in Central Europe. I could I could tell you that, uh, where they, they they denigrate Edison. I had to you know point out to some of my students. I point you know point out to them. Look at the timeline. So Edison stole his ideas from Tesla. Was is the is the claim here? First of all. Uh, Edison invents the phonograph, 1877, 1878. Then he patents the first commercially viable, you know, incandescent light, 1879. Uh, Tesla comes to the United States in 1884. Mm -hmm. I mean, just the timeline, time was, it is the 1870s, 1880s. Where did Edison get those ideas from Tesla? Did Tesla put them up on Instagram, you know, back in 1878, <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so right. I mean that that doesn't work. And then, of course, Tesla's greatest invention, the AC induction motor. Well, Edison didn't steal that. I mean, he fought it to the death, practically. You know, he, he he fought yeah. he fought against it. So so this is it, it, this is mythology. Uh, Edison's a towering inventor and genius, uh, as is Tesla. But uh, Edison didn't steal his ideas. Tesla's ideas. Uh, he, he may or may not have mistreated him when, when that time when he was when he was working in in his lab. But even that's even that's controversial. So, te but anyway, Tesla wasn't happy in his time that working for Edison, was he? Yeah, I mean, they were just very polarly opposite personalities. Um, and in fact, I think even in this first meeting, Tesla uh, made clear his his desire to to uh, innovate with AC. And right off the bat, Edison was like, don't do it. You're wasting your time. It is, it, the, the meeting was not promising, but there's a, a ship that has some electrical work that needs done. And Edison says, if you can fix this, uh, we'll, we'll talk. Tesla fixes the ship in 24 hours. Edison gives him the job. And you know, soon thereafter, Edison asks, asks Tesla to overhaul some dynamos. These were the DC generators that they used. And he says... Perhaps jokingly, we don't know. If you do it, I'll give you 50 grand. And Tesla finishes in a few months, comes back to Edison. I want my 50 grand. Uh, Edison says, that was a joke. You might not have understood because you're a foreigner. You don't really get th these types of humor. But uh, Tesla was not having it. Edison offered him a raise, $10 a week, raising him from $18 to $28 a week. And Tesla says, no, nah, I think I'm going to quit. So he quits. And here we have one of the, the greatest minds in electrical history, electrical engineering history, uh, now unemployed and goes to New York City to dig ditches in New York City. It's just it's just nuts. How yeah, for two dollars for two dollars a day. Uh, yeah, the, nobody knows the truth about that that Tesla Edison, Edison story. One 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 version. If Edison was a a great jokester. So I mean, it's possible that he 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 did say it and meant it as a as a, as a joke, and Tesla didn't understand it. But one version is that, you know is that 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 Charles Batchelor was you know involved in this exchange, and Batchelor evidently was notoriously stingy with money. So we never have corroborated that kind of offer from Edison, and and the company didn't have that kind of money anyway. <laughs> you know, was fifty thousand dollars was a lot of money, uh, you know, back in, in the eighteen eighties. So the story, the story may or may not be true. I don't know, but but Tesla and Edison obviously butted heads, like like you said. So here's Tesla, penniless, you know, digging ditches, uh, and, and you're really really struggling. But you know, he's a hero. Was, uh, yeah, yeah, heroes, what is, we could quote Shackleton again, obstacles are just things to be overcome. And Tesla, Tesla certainly uh, over, overcame that. And, you know, he, he had this, he is a genius, had his experience in electrical engineering by this time working in, you know, in, in Paris and then Edison in New Jersey. And in 1887, 1888, he develops the AC induction motor and he, and he, and he patents it. And, now he's on his way to fame and fortune. When, like, like you know, we said when he when he sells the patent rights to, uh, was it, did he sell the patent rights or did he did he license he licensed it to, to Westinghouse right for for like fifty or sixty thousand dollars? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not certain, but I think Westinghouse bought the patents as he often did. Um, 
and you know there was this agreement built into that that he would get he would get these royalties and we'll see in time what happens with those royalties but uh tesla ends his life penniless so from from rags to riches to rags again unfortunately yeah uh but he had a hell of a run you know and he uh, he, <laughs> he had a tesla, good run <laughs> yeah but but he lived large you could see that there's a great picture he's a good looking guy he he loved clothes you know it's, it was interesting he, he was if you'd think people are just they're individuals you know there's no the, the stereotypes just often don't fit but you think this guy is working he was a workaholic i don't think he ever had a romantic relationship did he at least at least not that i not that i know of uh so you think he'd there's be in his stories, lab but, wall. yeah we don't know yeah be in his lab all the time dressed in you know chemical splotched you know <laughs> you know dirty clothes and stuff but no, Tesla was a clothes horse. I mean, he he loved clothes. He you know he was men's fashion. He spent a lot of money on that. But one one of the accounts I read of his life, he dined. You know, he lived in New York City. He dined regularly at Delmonico's, which was an upscale, you know, real, real Tony New York restaurant back then. <laughs> lived in the Waldorf for years, and 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 when he left there or got kicked out, he owed them. He owed a, he owed a lot of money at the Waldorf. Something something he owed like twenty thousand dollars, which is worth something like you know four or five hundred thousand dollars today. He uh, he owed you know uh, at the, at the Waldorf. In fairness to Tesla, now, now that's just dishonest. I mean, he's living at he's living large at one of the most swank hotels in New York City. He's not paying and not paying the bills. I assume he got away with that. You know, simply because he was Nikola Tesla and he was, you know, a very highly famous, and highly respected inventor as well. He might be. Uh, but uh, he, he he did spend much of his money, not just on clothes and, you know, and fine, you know, fine dining, but on laboratory equipment. Tesla had the most state of the art, up to date equipment in his lab. And that cost money. That's what the money he the money he made, which was considerable. A lot of that got spent on on lab equipment, you know, to, to, that he could use in, you know, the endless experimentation that that, that he was doing. But he, he was a strange and, character. And entire laboratories. Yeah. He, yeah. I mean, he plowed a lot of money into his experiments and, and many of them really didn't go anywhere. He didn't have the sort of vision that Westinghouse had to say, OK, this is a technology that can be applied in this way. He didn't have that money making personality that Westinghouse had that, you know, that Edison, vision Edison of, too. Of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Edison, that, too. That Edison also had. Yeah. Both of them were very focused on useful technologies what are these things that we can harness for for this or that industrial purpose and just make life better and tesla was more the experimental uh engineer uh fi finding solutions to an incredibly difficult problems and making what westinghouse and and uh, well making what westinghouse at least was was doing possible and and more right. practicable yeah even for edison even despite the enormous error he made in the in the war of the currents he still was was very commercially viable he still he still made a lot of money he targeted his invention the phonograph the the electric light the uh, ultimately his contributions to the motion picture industry he made a lot of money and he didn't blow it I and mean, when he retired he was worth he was worth millions and that was you know again 100 years ago uh <laughs> millions was a lot of a lot more purchasing power then than it has i think he was worth 12 million when he retired Edison was when he retired, which was worth, worth even a lot more than that today. But yeah, Tesla was a visionary. You know, he didn't, he, he wasn't a, he wasn't a practical, you know, hands-on kind of guy. Uh, but it was, correct me if I'm wrong, because, you know, I've, I've read so many of these different stories. Uh, Tesla was the one, it wasn't a Tesla who envisioned using Niagara Falls to generate, you know, to generate the the power, you know, for the for the for AC, uh, and then and then generate electricity all all across the country using using the, that power. I think that was Tesla's vision, wasn't it? Yeah, and, and anyway. he said that he had a vision early on in life that that this could be possible, and he was when the opportunity came up through Westinghouse to do this. But uh, this this came about largely through the what I would regard as probably the victory of the current war. The 1893 Chicago Fair with General Electric. It's now taken Edison's name off the company. Uh, AC is on the on the rise, and D or sorry, DC. Yeah, AC is on the rise, and, and DC is on the descent. 
and GE built bids uh, $1.8 million to light the Chicago Fair, the, the Columbian Expedition or Exposition, sorry. And, uh, and Westinghouse build, build, bids uh, $394,000 uh, yeah, and wins the bid, of course. <laughs> Less than 25% of, course, of, the, of the price, right? He's cut off. Yeah, I mean, there was, a, there was an interim. I think GE also had an interim bid, like between when, when they found out how much lower Westinghouse was going to come in, they bid like half a million. But uh, Westinghouse wins this bid. And, you know, we talked last week about uh, Edison's dirty deeds in the in the current war and, and some of the things yeah. that he was doing. And so uh, but just to refresh our memory here, uh, Edison is trying to snuff out any possible future for uh, for D.C., Sorry for AC. AC technology. Yeah. And and so he's using it. He's, he's having he's staging demonstrations of electrocutions. And he also is instrumental in getting New York State to use a Westinghouse AC generator to uh, begin doing executions. And obviously the the uh, you know, the message being to people, this stuff is used to kill people. It's not safe. We shouldn't have this in our homes. He's he's very instrumental in, in this sort of smear campaign against AC and, and against Westinghouse in particular, but Westinghouse hey, remember, wins this. Remember bid. So let, let, let me let me jump in for just a second. There was no word mm -hmm. in the English language for, for electrocute some somebody back then, and Edison used the term "we're going to yeah. Westinghouse him." He, he took Westinghouse's name and used it as a verb. Yeah, well, Westinghouse him, meaning yeah. we'll fry him. So yeah, Edison. Yeah, I don't know was, if Edison came up with that, but that be, that became common parlance, right? For for being electrocuted. Yeah, back then. Yeah, it was Westinghouse. This, this this poor guy. <laughs> talk about talk about dirty tricks. Anyhow, the electrocute somebody is supposed to be you humane. It's supposed to be quick. You know, not when you hang them. Yeah. You know, sometimes sometimes the neck is broken and you hang there and you suffocate. It was supposed to be quick, but the first one was ghastly. I don't remember how long it took, but it, it took minutes. Four the guy, minutes. the guy was just four minutes. Four the guy minutes. is like being being roasted. And Westinghouse commented on the horror of that. He said he said they would have been better off if they use an axe. <laughs> so, yeah, it was horrible. But I'm, I'm sorry, I interrupted you with the, the story about Westinghouse and somebody. Well, this is the, this is the big triumph. So Westinghouse wins this this bid to light the Chicago Fair in 1893, and uh, but now you know Edison's got really the only viable bulb out there, and Edison's not going to allow his bulbs to be used for this this fair. So uh, Westinghouse has to find a solution. How's he going to do this? Well, he owns the patent for an earlier version of the light bulb, one that wasn't so practical for this, but he uses that as, as the basis for a new light bulb design. Uh, in months, uh, opens a glass factory, invents a new process for vacuuming out the air from the bulb, and manufactures 250,000 bulbs for use at the fair, and builds 12 75-ton polyphase generators larger than any any generators of the type that have ever been created before and and gets all of this to chicago in time for the fair um rover cleveland president at the time flips the switch and on turn a hundred thousand light bulbs um uh, uh, electrical uh electrically uh operated fountains uh this be just such a smashing success people see oh it's safe it's reliable it's efficient it even becomes the image that inspires L. Frank Baum, author of Wizard of Oz, to write the scene of the Emerald City. You know, the, the city and you, you see it from far and it's all lit and it's beautiful. So it's just it's just this smashing success. And it really is a turning point in the current war. And, and I would say probably the, the landmark victory for Westinghouse and Tesla. And and then it just snowballs from there. Right, right. And they, uh, yeah, they definitely triumphed decisively in, in the current war. And Westinghouse Company goes on to uh, great things, although eventually, you know, in, in, in some economic downturn, the, I think the, the company ends up in, in receivership, right? But uh, Westinghouse, Westinghouse was, a, was a wealthy man, even when the, when the company, you know, went bankrupt. Westinghouse personally, I guess, I guess he must have been a saver, John. He must have been, he must have been frugal because he had he had millions, uh, you know, in, in, in his personal his personal wealth. And um, I just want to say, 
something here from my own life. When I was a kid, call it 1960s, the Westinghouse uh, company was famous for manufacturing appliances. You know, Westinghouse refrigerators, Westinghouse stoves, Westinghouse, you know, uh, Westinghouse washers, washing machines. You know, they, they were in competition with General Electric. They were huge appliance, very successful. This, this, this was, you know, Westinghouse died in 1914, so I'm talking 1960s. So this is, you know, 45, 50, 50 years later. His company was, you know, and, and with, with that, and the logo was still the same, you know, that big W uh, uh, the, for, you know, for, for Westinghouse. It was, a very, it was a very successful. I remember, you know, a number of, you know, a number of my, my relatives, it's just little things that stuck in my mind, you know, in my, in my, my, my aunt's house, my, my mother's sister. Uh, you know, go to the refrigerator, you know, and, and, and you see Westinghouse, you know, is the, they were, they were manufacturing appliances. I don't, I don't know. I'm not sure. I haven't kept up with the appliance industry. I'm not sure if the Westinghouse company is still, is still in, in business today, you know, 50 or 60 years later, but they're still manufacturing. I think they are. I think you, you can still get Westinghouse appliances, I, you know, I believe, but I'm not, I'm not hundred percent sure about that, but, but certainly in my childhood days. It was a it was a very successful it was a very successful company. Uh, so went yeah, on, yeah. yeah, went on. Yeah, went it would on continue decades. long after Westinghouse uh, left the company. But back back in um, you know the the Barings Bank in London in 1890 went under and caused this financial panic, and a lot of investors had had lent money to Westinghouse's companies. And they called in their loans, and so he had to refinance all his debts. And when he did, the the new uh, the, the new bank rollers essentially said, "Well, you've got to lower the amount that you're spending research and buying up patents," because he was doing just he he was just dead ahead on development. It wasn't um, you know let's it, it, let's take this slowly. He would just plow large large amounts of money into whatever new thing happened to fascinate him. And, you know, the next big thing was uh, generating hydroelectric power from Niagara Falls. So he he plowed ahead with this, even though in, in 1891, he had this this problem with finances. And, and um, by 1896, it was, they were once again, ready to, to flip the switch and see what happens. And uh, they do. And then it, it, it uh, Buffalo, they get their first power from a few miles away. And, you know, it's just this incredible demonstration of Westinghouse and Tesla once again triumph with, with uh, alternating current. And it was ab about this time, actually, that Westinghouse came to Tesla. And he said, you know, this is really, it's really getting very hard for me to pay you your royalties. Can we, can we pause for a bit? I'm having financial difficulties in Tesla was uh, eternally grateful to Westinghouse for helping him show the world the power of, of AC and the capabilities that were made possible by it. And so Tesla uh, tears up the contract and he says, we're, we're good. Uh, and, and so, you know, from then on, Tesla's not no longer receiving his royalties and he doesn't really curtail his spending in accordance with that, as we've talked about. Right, right, uh, yeah. <laughs> Talk about you know the, there's an expression somebody has has beer income and sh and champagne tastes. Well, you know, well, he, it's, it's Tesla before that had had champagne income and champagne taste. Now he's got beer income. He needs to modulate his taste. But yeah, but but he was not. He did not do that. Westinghouse Westinghouse must have because I, I from what I read, even when his company went bankrupt, he personally. Had still had millions, so he must have been a very frugal uh, saver, which is always always a, a wise policy. But uh, one one other thing we should touch on about Westinghouse was his relationship with his workers. Uh, Westinghouse was known for his extreme benevolence. Uh, even in the movie The Current War, they portrayed him as this real, you know, you know this real good natured guy. He took care of his workers and everything. And I was sitting there thinking, why if Hollywood, if Hollywood presents a millionaire businessman, you know, as a benevolent, you know, good natured guy who took care of, took care of his workers in real life. He must've been, he must've been, you know, quite a giant. And he was, he regarded his workers yeah. as family. You know, uh, they were family. He, he, he was very 
concerned about their well-being. He's 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 sometimes credited with uh, with inventing the weekend uh, because he. Uh, but mo most factories then and jobs, you work six days a week. He had, he had Sunday off. But Westinghouse started to get have start to cut down on on that. And has work is work half a day on Saturday. So they have what they they got one and a half days off. So you start you know, moving towards you know moving towards a two day you know a, a a two day weekend. And you know he's just. He was a very generous, very good-natured person. Never had a strike. Never had labor problems. Unlike some of the other, you know, industrialists and entrepreneurs of the day. And when we discuss Carnegie at some point, which we have to on the Hero Show, the Homestead strike was just, you know, it was horrifyingly violent. We'll, but we'll get to that. Westinghouse never had any labor. Never had any labor problems. And um, you know, you could see a lot of his his the goodwill here. That years later, when when uh, his his old friend Tesla was in was in you know financial difficulties, he got kicked out of the oh, he got he left the Waldorf in debt. He, he got kicked out of the St. Regis, another fancy you know swank New York City hotel, in part because he didn't pay the bills, but in part because his pigeons his pet pigeons were leaving such a mess you know in this upscale hotel that the other patrons uh, complained about it. Uh, Westinghouse paid. Tesla's bills at that point, even though he wasn't working for the for the company uh, anymore, he paid his rent at these you know at these Tony New York City hotels and start to pay him again as a consultant. Tesla Tesla wouldn't take charity, so Westinghouse gave it to him as a consulting fee, even though I'm not sure Tesla was doing any work for him at that point. So uh, you know, Westinghouse motives may have just been out of, out of kindness and goodwill to, towards somebody who had done a, a lot of good work for him and helped him. Do a lot of good things, a lot of, reach a lot of achievements, and make a lot of money. Well, it's, it's, it's some more cynical, probably anti-capitalist writers say, well, Westinghouse didn't want the bad publicity from you know his his former employee being penniless and you know and and, and in financial such financial difficulties. Given Westinghouse's track record, I would say the betting the betting is more on goodwill and you know and and being a just a generous, good natured guy as as his as his motivation here. So, but regardless, uh, the benevolence and the, you know, and just the kindness of George Westinghouse uh, is, is very well, is very well documented. Yeah. This shown in another innovation of his, he bought a tract of land near Lance and uh, set up how he, he had houses built and then sold them at very inexpensive, reasonable prices to his employees. And also, um, he, he set up for educational and recreational opportunities for them as well. So he was loved by his workforces and he was respected by workers all over the world. Uh, and, and he very much had the love of Tesla. Um, I know that uh, even after Westinghouse died, Tesla was in dire straits and reached out to the Westinghouse company and they continued to, to pay his bills even after Westinghouse was gone. So um, you know, the, the Westinghouse company, there was just this ethos uh, built into it by George Westinghouse of, of goodwill toward one's employees and, and one's fellow uh, fellow geniuses in the case of Tesla. And, um, right. you know, this is every bit as, as much of an innovation as, as Westinghouse's many, many patented technological innovations. Right. You're absolutely right, John. And what, what, one example of that is, in contrast to Edison, when Westinghouse's employees came up you know, with a new idea to be patented, Westinghouse didn't co-opt that and, 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 and patent it under his own name. He, had, he, he permitted his employees to patent it under their name, uh, the, you know, the guy who came up with the idea. In contrast to Edison, because when you're working for Edison, if you work in his laboratory, you came up with a new idea to be a new or a new method or, or an invention to be patented. It was patented under Edison's name. So Westinghouse gave the credit to the you know to the to yeah. the innov innovative thinker here. And uh, uh, one example, <clears throat> excuse me, in the current war. A great movie, which if, if everybody out there in Hero Land, if you haven't seen it, I strongly recommend it. I don't, again, I don't know if this is literally accurate, but it, it fits, again, if, if the story ain't true, it ought to be. It fits Westinghouse's uh, character when he says something to the effect, if you want to get famous, shoot a president. But if you want to develop what I call a legacy, leave the world a better place than you found it. 
and uh, you know whatever whatever the dirty tricks of Edison and and all this, uh, the horrors uh, the, the injustice towards Westinghouse, all three of them left the world you know a much better place than they found it. Their innovations, their inventions have so dramatically improved human life that they all deserve a place on the on the hero show, and they they've all earned it, and they have all, they've all received it. Absolutely. It's a beautiful way to end this thing. Westinghouse, Tesla, and Edison, all are heroes. And uh, they had different achievements, different flaws, but uh, we honor them all. Yes. I mean, I'm, Ayn Rand sh shows brilliantly in, in her, moral, her moral theory that human life and the, the advancement of human life and the, the, the attainment of human flourishing, this is the standard of moral value. And all three of these heroes, they've, they all uh, advanced human life dramatically. And that's why, you know, we honor Edison, Westinghouse, Tesla. And I, and I think in, in, in their name, and everybody, everybody, to you, John, everybody out there in Hero Land, have a more heroic day and have a, have a more heroic life, everybody.